Hello, my name is Dwight Norris of FishNetwork.com, and today we're going to be talking about how to use crankbaits. Now, if you aren't used to every type of fishing lure out there, let me describe what a crankbait is. It's usually a minnow-like lure that has a skinny or wide body. It has a lip, or maybe it doesn't, or a style of lip, and it's made to mimic a fish and it can do a variety of things, but mainly it's made for going under the water, shaking and shining possibly, and making a lot of noise. There's a lot of variations within a crankbait and its use. But the most important thing that people have learned over time, especially the pros, is that this is a fish finding lure. That's one of its main functionalities. So before we get into all the details, let me work down what we're going to be going through today. We'll be going through the types of crankbaits, the, uh, the depths that they can go, the uh, types of things you should use with it, like knots and line types and like how to retrieve it. You'll be talking about something I like to call match the hatch. You'll hear about that further into this video. Also, there's techniques to use when you're using crankbaits. And you also want to hear about what type of gear should you be using with your crankbait to make it function well for your environment or structure that you're working on. So first, let's start with the types of crankbaits. First, there are shallow types, which you have made which you may have seen from Rapala lures. They have the long skinny ones, the short ones, they have the tiny bills. The When I say a tiny bill, it usually goes from the neck of the lure all the way to the tip. It can be around hmm, a quarter of an inch. And the reason for that is so that it doesn't dive too deep. We want it to give it jerks and maybe a tiny slow retrieve in between, but not like a constant reel. That's not what your shallow uh, crankbait is for. It's really for making small jerking actions with reeling, and then it, it wiggles like this, and it, sh it stops. It, it kind of mimics a minnow that's in the shallows near the, uh, the lily pads and weeds and the uh, fallen logs and timber, and it's moving about in an area which it thinks it's safe, because you'll notice that a lot of smaller fish, when they're they call them, I think they call them, they call them a fish fry. They're very young and they're trying to stay away from the open water where all the predators are. All the largemouth bass, all the smallmouth bass, all the pike, all the musky, all the catfish, turtles, etc, etc. They want to stay shallow, they want to stay in the cover and hidden and eating whatever they eat until they get bigger and they can go out and they can become the predator. Particularly when you're, um, uh, when you're crankbait fishing for bass. And that's mainly what I'll be hitting on, bass fishing, because that's one of the uh, the mainstays when it comes to fishing, fishing uh, freshwater and saltwater sometimes, because striped bass is a huge thing up and down the East Coast here in the United States, but probably in other places as well. So another type is the mid-level. And when I talk about mid-level, it's made to either uh, dive to a certain level using the bill. The, uh, the length of the bill makes it dive deep and the width of the bill determines how much it wobbles and how much water it displaces. Now most people uh, don't really understand why you would want a fish to wobble. Certain types of bait fish, herring, shad, shiners, uh, swim in a certain way. Some are wider, some rock side to side really wide when they when they when they actually swim and some are just with a the small tail action and they just go straight forward maybe they're long and skinny kind of like a like a mini barracuda so it's important to mimic the bait fish as closely as possible because the bigger a bass gets the smarter it gets and the better its sensing organs are it can see better it can hear better it can taste better it can pretty much do everything better. Unlike us humans, when we get old, we actually lose a lot of our senses. 
Not so for largemouth bass, and not so for many fish. Uh, but for largemouth bass in particular, they are getting better while you are actually diminishing. So make sure your knowledge and your skill increases over time so you can master the bass. Um, got a little off the, off the point there, but back to the uh, types of crankbaits. Uh, last, uh, not lastly, but um, the, another, another type is uh, deep crankbaits. Um, they have very long builds. I'm talking like two to three inches long. Sometimes the bills that uh, the crankbait uses can be just as long as the crankbait itself. And that's, and this kind of makes a weird, it could make an obscurity in the way your crankbait looks and how it moves and how it dives. I don't particularly like it too much. I say if the bill is a certain size, the actual bait should increase as well. Because sometimes it's hard to hide a crankbait bill when you're diving deep. Yes, it's dark, but that bill is displacing a lot of disturbance in the water. And sometimes that will get a bass to bite, but if it's like not like invisible, like so, uh, they usually come in a clear uh, opaqueness, so the, the fish can't see it even underwater. But if you're in open water you're, and you're not like touching anything, it looks like part of the fish. And it honestly makes the fish look a little weird. They're like, hmm, why is that fish shaped like that? Their, their sensing organs can see sort of what uh, something moving through the water looks like. And it might get confused and that might be uh, the reason you're not catching fish as opposed to attracting them and then getting them more curious and biting. So watch out for that when you're fishing deep. There are also some other types. One of them is a sinking crankbait and those are weighted and are actually um, tested to sink a certain amount over a period of time. Usually on the side of the box you'll see what this rate is and they're great for certain areas. Because when they reach a certain depth, they'll actually stop sinking and they'll remain in a suspended state. And there's also suspended lures that are not really timed. They're just made to, to go down to a certain depth. But there's also sinking ones that are made to tick down to a certain depth. Like, so that's a good way to work different depths to find where the fish are. And I like to use those in open water, the sinking ones. The suspended ones are when you know the fish are at a certain level and you can use your radar and sonar units to figure out where the fish are and your your own mind and the topographic maps to figure out where the fish are at certain times at certain seasons at certain water clarities at certain times during the day a certain title the stages and etc etc there, there are many ways to figure out what's happening and where the fish should be for the type of fish that you're fishing for so there's also a floating type of crankbait and those just sit on the surface mainly. They might go down about a foot max. And those are sort of in the same area as the shallow ones, but the floating ones will absolutely not go down. They're more buoyant and they can also be confused as a, uh, a top or a lure or a popper, except they don't have the concave mouth to push the water, to make it look like um, a school of uh, bay fish is going by. But you know, lure manufacturers like to make many variations to mimic certain things, and that's just another variation. And the last uh, type of crankbait is the lipless crankbait. And it's a type of crankbait that I've only used for one type of fish and successfully, and that's a striped bass. I usually use a half ounce silver like slash chrome crankbait. I have one over here I'll be showing you in a second to catch those fish. Now I usually I usually use those when the striped bass are coming over top of a a sandbar and there's and the water will go up, you know, it's a couple of feet, like four or five feet. You could almost stand up if the water in the river wasn't going so fast. And then it just drops down to like ten to fifteen and right there at the bottom somewhere at mid depth they're around, they're around at like 10 feet or so are the striped bass and they're waiting for those bay fish to roll over the top of that sandbar and they just nail them and that's where i've had the most success 
with a crankbait. Just bringing that uh that rattling, super shiny crankbait over the top of that thing, and they see it, and they hear it, and they see the size of it, and they see the speed that's going, and they have no choice but to take the uh, the criteria they have, the the sound, the shape, and the the flashiness of it, and decide I'm gonna eat that. It looks like a delicious minnow and chomp. So if you're into striped bass fishing, this is this one technique I would suggest using. Uh, it's also used well for striped bass going next to buoys as well, but pretty much anything will work when they're sitting next to a buoy. Anything they normally and naturally eat. You just have to get their attention. They have to be hungry. And they're usually smaller ones. So they're very jumpy when they're young. When they get older, like I said, they get smarter, get smarter and they're not going to go after that thing. But for largemouth bass, it's the same thing. I would use it around cover. You might get hung up a lot. You might hit something like a stump, but man, when you hit something, that's when they attack. So let's look at a few of the crankbait examples I have right over here. Now that we're hot on the topic, let's talk about, just poke myself, uh, the lipless crankbait. As you can see here, let me bring it a little closer. This lipless crankbait has no real lip except for the top of the, the crankbait here. It has a blue top. It could be black or blue. It really just needs to be darker because this is mimicking what a bait fish would have on its body. It's going to be darker on the top like most fish and lighter on the bottom. The reason fish are darker on the top and lighter on the bottom when they're not a predator, mainly, they're a bait fish, there's something that's going to be eaten by something else, is when a fish is looking down on it, it sees the darkness of the water and the darkness of the top of the fish matches it or is close so it's harder to see them. And when a fish is below them, they see the sun. Hopefully they see the sun if it's the daytime. And the light, the lightness is usually white under a fish and that will match the sun. Therefore, it's harder to see them. So this is a safety mechanism for fish. And you should make sure you match the hatch when you do that. That's just one part of matching the hatch. Got off there early. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but yes, it's very simple. When you pull it, it's going to be at an angle like this. So most of the time, your fish are going to bite the end of it. And they'll, that's if they're smaller. They're catching up to it because it, it moves really fast. If they get their whole moth around it, man, they're really starving. But most of the time, I'd say 80% of the time, uh, they're going to bite this back in. So make sure that these bad boys are sharp in the back. Make sure they're, they're connected correctly. And you may even do well with a, a trailer if you're into that sort of thing. Or maybe a little bit of flash like a feather or or um, something red to show that it's possibly hurt or um, bleeding. As you can see here, in the back there's a little bit of red. I'm not sure why they think a fish can see that. Maybe they can. It's in the front too, but it's supposed to show that the uh, this is an injured bait fish, which makes the fish like more like a, a bull. Like they get that, they see that red and like, whoa, you're hurt now. It's gonna be an easy meal. I'm coming after you. You are the weak. Um, link in the chain if there's a school. Um, the next one is, let me look closer here, the Rebel Double Deep Shad imitation. So this is a shad replica, at least one type. It's green, has the black top, the dark top, can't see me, and the lighter but kind of orange and yellow bottom. This is more of a murky water kind of shad. And the deep dive is because this thing is right about an, this over an inch, this over the inch, this bill. As you see, it's clear, like I said before. It's not like super wide or square, but it's, it's just like more of the, uh, the normal shape for a bill when, when they go deeper. It's not gonna have too wide of a profile. It would probably rock no more than this when it goes, but that's enough. And as you can hear, let me stop the, obviously there's some sound built in because why not make some sound? Uh, 
So when a fish hears a sound, it's, it's similar to a rock hitting another rock in the water. Click, 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 click. So um, ball bearings going against something metal is a perfect imitation for a minnow and especially a crayfish. So if you have a crayfish lure, you want to hit that thing all up in the rocks, all up in the, the trees, make it shake, make it rattle, and make it hit stuff and stir up dirt. That's a little tip. We're not talking about... Uh, well, and there are uh, there are crayfish crankbaits, and those require trying to get hung 90% of the time, 90, 99% of the time. So this particular one would go around oh, man. Um, between eight. I, I'd actually I'd say eight and maybe even 12 feet. I, I'd I'd say eight eight to ten. This is what this length was. If it was double the size, we're talking. 15 plus, maybe even up to 20, depending on the density of the water and the uh, the current. I don't have any of those because I don't fish that deep in the area around here. Even though they are in that deepness of water right now, they're in, there's holes in the Charles River that go down to 30, 36 feet. There's only one hole that's 36 feet. Most of them are between 25 and 30. but I found a website on MIT.com that they joined up with this uh, collective community called Crabs, where they uh, graphed a whole lake, the whole uh, river, the um, the seaside part up to the first dam, and it shows where all all the holes are, and it shows some decent um, topography. Now I found some places where I can fish and catch them, but it would. Uh, require me to one, have a boat, or have a extremely heavy weight on some live bait. And that's why I ordered some European night crawlers on Amazon. And they they should be here Saturday. And on Monday, that will be my video. Me trying to cast, I don't know, three, four, five ounce weights with a, a liter and a gigantic European night crawler out to one of the edge of those holes I can reach from the dock there. And seeing if I can't entice something to buy out there in this super cold pre-winter weather. Huh. I'm going to go on tangent here a lot, but you know, this is important stuff. Uh, the last is this Rapala Countdown minnow. This is one of the sinking minnows, which is also something that's used shallow. It goes down to, I used to know this. It, it sinks at approximately one second. Every second it sinks a foot, which is pretty fast. That's boo, underwater. One, two. I've actually looked at it and it doesn't seem like it's that fast. It seems like every second it goes like six inches. But you can look here. You can stop the video and just read that if it's not blurry. And this is the lure, as you see, not too expensive, $9.99. Oh. Apple account that minnow, just remember that. And this is the minnow. It's about two inches long, has that small bill. And also when you're looking at the bills, especially for the shallow ones, you'll notice that when they're shallow, they're more flat or down instead of going this way. Because when it goes this way, it's going to dive deeper and it's going to angle the bait. And that's going to happen naturally, even with a, a, a lipless bait. But if you had it like this and you dragged it, the actual bait wouldn't go, would be kind of off balance. That's something they've had to deal with, with the natural use of a bill. It's not perfect, but it's better than anything. And as you've seen here, I've lost some trebles. I noticed I've, I've lost two trebles and one is bent. I noticed when I try to get into those, uh, into the trees, into the bushes, into the stumps, into the lily, lily pads, that I got hung a lot. And I was like, ah, oh, this is horrible. But that's when I got the bites. And when I got hung, I just did a slow pull. And I was like, oh, man, it's going to break. I got this monofilament on here. It sucks. It's not. Great line, I should just pull it all off and just throw it away and put some better stuff on there, some string or 
something, some cigar, not, not cigar, so, something, Berkeley, something better. But uh, I noticed that the hooks actually just bend and break. They only handle a certain size fish, which means I get my $10 bait back and I can go somewhere and get some trebles and replace these. I'll remember to try to get some trebles that actually break like these so that the next time it happens, I don't actually lose my lure. So that's a really good tip. When you have expensive minnows like this, like this Rapala or you have a, a Rebel or Zoom or whoever you get your crankbaits from, try to get crankbait with treble hooks or replace them with treble hooks that are bendable and will break before the loop will or before the, uh, the actual, either one of these loops will break or your line, particularly if you're a light line, you know, your six pound test, you're close. Uh, maybe the hook won't, won't bend, but I have, I think I have an eight or 10 pound test, like crappy monofilament and the hook bent before the line broke. I was, I was shocked. So now that the example uh, crankbaits over, let's go to the next section. The next section is about depths. Now I've talked about this previously. Now the main depths are between zero and 20 feet in general. The shallow ones will go between one and three. The mid depths will go between three and, and um, three and 10. And the deep divers will be go will go between 10 and 20. The sinking minnows will usually go down to maybe six feet, no more. The floating ones will will go one foot and come right back up, just like a bobber. And the lipless ones will go straight to the bottom if you want them to, but you'll have to stop and then use it as a jig. But that's a technique that you can use. So when you're actually doing your your reels, you'll have to think about how you want to work it and there are many different ways. I'll talk about those techniques in a few minutes. The next section is match the hatch. We're finally here. What do I mean by match the hatch? In general, you have certain bait fish in your body of water. I totally support you or compel you to go find out what those bay fish are. If they're threadfin shad, if they're some kind of regular minnow, if they're herring, if they're shiners, I mean, the list goes on and on. And there's different types of each. So go to your local um, state website, go to the fishing and hunting section, figure out where the fish types are. There should be some downloadable document, probably in a PDF. If not, call them and then figure out what um, predator fish you have there that you want to catch and what bait fish are there that you want to know about and then get pictures of them and then go online, uh, find your favorite uh, lure manufacturer of crankbaits. I personally like Rapala. I've used them for a very long time and then make or find the lure that matches them as close as possible and then get one of each type. Get a shallow one, get a mid one, get a deep one, get a sinking one, get a floating one, and if possible, get a lipless one too. Get them all because that's what the fish know. They know those fish are there. It looks exactly like them. And if you can work it exactly like them, you're gonna catch more fish. And that's exactly what you want. That's what I want for you out of this website. I want to teach you how you can catch more fish and matching the hatch is a great thing for you to do anywhere you are in the fresh water, in the salt water, you need to make sure you do that because if you do, it's one, one little, uh, uh, one little characteristic that the fish has to decipher when it chooses whether it's going to ignore this thing or it's going to investigate it further because it looks like something it wants to eat. So you have to hit all the check marks. And one of those check marks is the size. Is this the correct size for the type of uh, bait fish that I'm using? Here, we have a lot of herring. We have, three diff we have two different types and they can go between um, five inches all the way up to a foot. And 
Don't be fooled. The largemouth bass will go for those foot long ones. They are crazy. They'll try to eat anything that's smaller than them. Even something that's two thirds of its size. And you want to you want to figure out the size of it, uh, not just the uh, the length, but the girth. If it has a belly, you want to you want to have that strange belly that it has. The fins, if possible, as well. Of a, of a, I've seen crankbaits that have fins like it. Like the lipless crankbait has a mini fin. You now it's hooky and everything. <sighs> Including me. It has that uh, that fin up top. You want to match that. I've seen some other ones that have the other parts of the fins. Not the side dorsal fins, but the top fins. You really want to match the size as closely as possible. Um, also the color, the different color of the uh, the fish. And I've noticed sometimes with the big manufacturers that they actually have exact named replicas for the different types of bait fish. If you just go online or go to their websites and then search, you know, Threadfin Shad Lure, boom, you'll get a list. By now. That's what you need. If you're looking to, you know, ramp up your kit and get things that will help you to, um, to catch more fish, that's what you need to do. Find the bait fish, match the hatch, find it online, buy it, or go to your local bait shop or wherever you like to get your lures. It doesn't matter. Just, just go get it because that's going to improve your fishing almost instantly. No skills, no um, techniques, just matching the hatch. Um, there's also the wobble, which has to do with the bill. The fish actually moves in a certain way. You'll really only uh, be able to witness this if you see them come in and you actually see them walking through, swimming through the water. Maybe you can find a smaller one that's shallow, that's trying to hide, and see how it swims. Or maybe go online and watch a video of that particular bait fish, maybe in a fish tank, being fed as bait and it's trying to run away, and see how it wobbles. Is it is it a real walker? rocker side to side or is it like a um, a very um, like barracuda like skinny and fast and strong and only uses only uses its tail for movement um hmm I think there's something else I would like to yes and there's also the hook size which isn't actually part of the fish but it's important because Depending on the size of the fish that you're that you're trying to match, you'll have to match the hook size to it as well. The manufacturers try to use the most standard and most natural looking hook size for a bait fish, but sometimes it's too large, it's too wide, it's too heavy, and sometimes it can interfere with what the bait fish is trying to look like. It looks like the bait fish almost exactly but it has two dangly things from it that are super huge and oversized. This is when you want to trade in those treble hooks for something else, something that takes up less space, but is still sharp and will still hook the fish depending on the size of the fish and the way its mouth is um, structured. It shouldn't be a problem. I primarily suggest you to get smaller hooks than what the manufacturer provides, but this is really getting into the like, deep, you know, pro level kind of a uh, talk here. And pros have their ways of doing things and they do them very well. They test over and over and over and over again. And that's really how you get better at anything. You have to test, which means fishing more. And fishing more takes a couple of things to do. One, you have to be able to catch well, that fishing more just takes more time. You just need more time to fish. And that requires you to make sacrifices and decisions about what you do with your time. You can, you know, sit in front of the, some kind of screen all day, you know, YouTube, Facebook, on your phone or on a desktop or at a TV screen for hours and hours and then realize, oh, wait, man, I really wanted to go fishing. Well, well you decided to sit in front of the TV and maybe you should have spent that time fishing. That's a decision. We all have decisions. And if you want to catch more bass, there's other decisions for that as well, not just time. You can get better at skills. You can get better gear. You can get help 
from people who are better than you and learn from them and even use their skills and abilities to put you on the fish so that you don't fail and that usually costs money. So let's talk about crankbait techniques now. Um, the most important one that you need to know is you need to hit something. <laughs> Not with your fist, I mean with your crankbait. Crankbaits are primarily used around two types of structures. One of them is sharp drops. The other is structure, like branches and stuff. And fish are in both those areas, areas primarily. So when your crankbait is coming into something, you're like, oh man's a tree, I should get it out of here. I'll let it float through the top and pull it around. No, no sir. Rip it through there, not, not fast, but let me describe this. If there's a tree coming into the water and it's coming at you straight like this and the branches are coming at you like that, get it into one of the grooves in the nooks of the tree and work it through there. It'll hit a branch and as soon as it hits that branch, pause for a second. Not for long, just bow and then reel it again. And it hits the next thing, bow. Let it float up for a second and, and then keep going. One of those moments when it hits it and floats for a second, the fish is going to come after it and gobble that thing down. That's when they hit those things and you should really get in there and, you know, decide that if I get hung, I'll try to get it out. But know that you're going to get hung a lot, but you're going to catch more fish. And the reason for this is when a fish sees a minnow or a bay fish hit something accidentally or not and then stop and then float away, they think it's stunned. And when you've seen a small fish die in a fish tank, it just stops moving and slowly floats to the surface and goes belly up. That's what it sees. It's like, oh, oh stunned fish. It sees the belly. You're like, oh, you expose your belly and it sucks it right up. Want to think about it? It's a reaction bite, and reaction bites are the best because they don't require they don't require any thinking. Now the same thing sort of happens on sharp drops. You want to start it barely in the shadow. Sorry, I can't see that. You want to start it in the shallows and then bring it down the hill. And when it goes down the uh, the sharp drop, you want to get it right on top of it. You want to hit every type of structure that is on that drop and if there isn't any structure on that drop, work it for a little while, but then go find some place that has structure. Um, stumps, logs, trees, um, underwater grass, uh, man-made structure, anything, anything that's not normal. Fish love structure, and if it's on a sharp drop, they really love it. And if it's uh, near a place where bait fish are um, congregating, they like, they like it even better, like a point. Oh man, that's like a trifactor. That's why you see people in those big pro bass tournaments working drops near a point and they talk about, oh, there's a stump field down there and they're hitting it. Boom, it hits the stump, they float it up. And there's like a, a basically a school of bass just looking at it and they see it, boom, hit it and they see it stunned belly come up for a second and they hit it. They know it can't get away. There's no shallows to chase it through. There's a ton of other pre of uh, competition here, so if they don't go after first, somebody might fly past them and grab their easy meal. And they don't want to do that. That's an easy meal. It's right in front of me. I mean, that's what you want to do. Uh, there's also different types of uh, other other types of uh, crankbait te techniques. And one of them is a steady retrieve. I don't really recommend a steady retrieve, but most people do this because we learn to fish things like spinnerbaits, which you should also do similar things with. Hit stuff with that too. It's another um, type of bait that helps you, one, find fish, and two, find structure, and three, find the fish. It helps you do all three which helps you learn about where you fish there's stumps down there there's a drop there there's fish usually here there's bait fish over there etc etc it helps you kind of map the land without a hummingbird sonar unit
So use crankbaits and spinnerbaits a lot when you get to a new area or you're trying to discover if fish are here or not. Um, a fast retrieve, I say it's not a good thing. One is because a fast retrieve will actually displace too much water on a lip of a crankbait and actually cause it to rise in, instead of dive. Because if you rip it too much and whoosh, it doesn't actually wobble faster. There's a, a level of wobble that it will take when enough water is pushing on it. And if too much water pushes on it, it will actually pull to one side and you'll see your line kind of go into a side or, or the other way. And it's, re it's really w too much water displacing off the bill and it decides that it can't take it, the wobble anymore. And the wobble goes wild and it pretty much wipes out like a car trying to go around a corner with too much speed and really bad tires. Another good uh, crankbait technique is actually the jerk and stop area uh, technique, which is not unsimilar as the, uh, the hit stuff and stop technique, but you're just doing it in open water. You do some jerks, you, you pause it, you reel it a little bit, steady retrieve, and then you jerk it, and then you pause it. And you can do this in a variety of, of uh, intermittent stages, and it's really dependent on you. Maybe you find a special technique that works for your fish. And you're like, oh, this is the way to do it, man. You have to do it exactly this way. You have to jerk three times, pause, jerk it three more times, then steady reel, then pause, then jerk it again. I guarantee that'll work. But it's really just when the fish sees it and they see that it's doing something erratic, but similar to what bait fish do, and it'll get them to bite. So your special technique may or may not be special, but if you believe it is, that means it is special. So keep doing it and keep telling everybody about it. It is your special technique. I I don't have one. I, I do things at random and random works. Uh, and the last thing I would like to talk about is crankbait fishing gear. The two types of things you'll want to really think about when you are fishing crankbaits for bass or anything else are the rod and the reel <laughs> and also the line so first of all you want to use a long rod seven and if possible eight feet and you want a soft tip the reason you want something long is because you want to the longer your rod is the more you can point it down and the deeper your crankbait will go it gets deeper at a uh, at a magnitude greater dependent on the length of your rod. That's just one variable. And the soft tip is so that you feel the little boop when the, when the, when the bass grabs it and then tries to let it go once it feels that, if it figures out that it's not a real fit um, bay fish. So that soft tip can help you with the feel. Um, the second thing is you want to use a bait casting reel. And that's you don't really know what a bait casting reel. That's the one with the the horizontal um, um, the horizontal reel of line, and you actually thumb the line with your finger here, and then you cast it out. And then while you're casting, you have to use your your thumb to either let the line go out or not. And this will takes a lot of practice if you don't know how to do it because the first couple times or first 50 times you're going to get some crazy bird's nests and sometimes they're so bad you just have to cut all the line off so i suggest you practice in your yard if you're new to bait cast reels but they are great for crankbaits because they're smooth they're fast they have great ball bearings they're quiet and for reeling in a crankbait there's really no faster reel than that you need to be able to get up your, your slack line and then get a fast enough and easy enough reel um, speed with your wrist to get down to those deep levels if you're using a deep diving crankbait. The line should be fluorocarbon. Why fluorocarbon? Because it's the lightest line and this light line will sink the fastest and the easiest. So if you need to go deep, but you don't have to worry about, you know, catching like a mango shark. <laughs> it's just something super huge. 
then fluorocarbon is the way to go. You can get that anywhere. Get it online, get it to your local bait shop, get it at the retail store, wherever they sell it. And that should help you catch more fish with a crankbait. So if you have any questions, please go to the comments below and you know subscribe might be a button here there should be a subscribe button down there go to the website fishnetwork.com you can get your 10-step process to go fishing at work pdf right on the front page that should be a little link there and then you just subscribe and you know then you'll get great information about catching bass about catching more fish about getting more time to catch more fish and everything else also if you go in the middle of the page, you should see a how to catch more bass PDF, which is a 45 page document of tips and techniques and tricks and a lot of learning about how a bass um, reacts and how it sees the environment and how it actually functions. And that's where I talk about how a bass gets smarter over time instead of older like us, older and slower. It gets stronger and faster and smarter. It has better reflexes and everything. It's crazy. But you can get that document for free. Just sign up and you'll also be put on the same list where you'll get more helpful information from me. So remember, I'm Dwight Norris and I'm trying to help you get more time to go catch fish. Whether it be bass or walleye or, or trout or catfish or striped bass or, you know, fill in the blank. Whatever you like to catch. I'm here to help you. So please... If you have any questions or you need uh, guidance or you just want to know how to catch more bass, just give me a contact through the email on the website, the comments below. If you write a comment, I will reply in due time, which will probably be less than a day. So, once again, I'm Dwight Norris of FishNetwork.com telling you to go fishing and use some crankbaits.